So without further ado. One of the reasons that we're here, and I'll let, uh, I'll let Audrey introduce herself later on because she's got a list this long of her credentials and I will undoubtedly miss many of them and then I'll hear about it later. Uh, one of the reasons that we're here is some of the, the work that you guys have done uh, on the Missouri River anyway. Uh, Kathy and I have six children. One of them is Leslie down in Australia. She is uh, working on her marine biology degrees, actually a couple of masters right now. Last summer, she came up to teach for the independent school district she, to, to teach marine biology. Part of this teaching that she did for the kids was, let's go down and clean up the Missouri River. And I think that she got a hold of Vicki, I believe. I don't have my glasses on, but I think Vicki's out there. We got a, she got a hold of Vicki and some others, and she took the children down via bus to the Missouri River, and they did a, a day-long cleanup out in the river. Thank you very much. I don't know the amount of stuff that they actually got out of there, but uh, I, the stuff I saw was quite a lot. One of the things that Leslie does in Australia is beach cleanups. And they do a source reduction. After they clean up a beach, they sort out everything, and they try to determine where this trash came from. If they can determine a specific uh, area, they go to that area and they figure out how they can reduce the amount of uh, the, the source reduction. Plastic, they picked up a lot of plastic pebbles of some sort. They were able to trace it back to the manufacturing and the distribution of them. And in Australia, they've taken ways to prevent that from happening. Now, what, is that, what does Australia have to do with us? A lot. During one of their beach cleanups, and it was a little island off of Australia, I see the head shaking, you know where I'm going with this, okay? There, it's a specific beach, and, and Leslie will watch this later on, I'll apologize, I don't remember the name of the, of the beach, but they take the boats out to it, they clean up just bags and bags and bags and bags and bags and bags and everything. So they're on the, on the boat going back, and they're starting to, starting to put this in the piles that belong, and this is a plastic, and this is a whatever, this is whatever, and somebody picks up a crate, a square crate, well, two foot by two foot by about eight inches tall or so, and, and starts scraping on it. And he says, hey, it's got writing on it. And he scrapes on it. And he says, it says, K, Kansas, Kansas City, Kansas City Mo. Anybody know where that is? And of course, Leslie's going, well, that's my hometown. Yes, I know where that is. Long story short, this was a Twinkie crate <laughs> that started here in Kansas City. In 2011, before the flood. Bingo. Thank you for pointing that out, Vicki. This was before things accidentally got washed into the river. How did it get down there? Did it start in the Missouri River and make its way down and go through the different uh, gyros or gyros or whatever they call the, the, the rotations in the oceans? And how did it get there? So during her class, she instructed the kids, you tell me. So part of their educational process. And it didn't take long for these hungry young minds to say, that could have started right here. That could have started from one of our landfills, from somebody carelessly throwing it out, some college kid going and it fell off their vehicle. But the point was that those kids now understand that whatever goes in this mighty mo, it may wind up down on the beach of Australia. Whatever goes in the mighty mo may wind up being eaten by the turtles and killing the turtles in Australia. So that combined with the best area in the entire area, Wayne City Landing, we're here. I can ask any of you if your relatives have been here in the United States for more than more than 100 years. And if they have, I could pretty much guarantee you they came through Wayne City Landing. I'm going to oversimplify this, and Audrey will, will kind of bounce back and forth a lot. If you've got any questions that I don't know the answer to, she does. So we'll probably start with her. Um, in anywhere from 1825 till 1851, 1852 or so, if you wanted to go west, you jumped on a steamship, in St. Louis. You took that two and a half, three day cruise up the Missouri River, and if you lived it, you got off on Wayne City Landing. 
at Wayne City Landing. You went up the, what, 300-foot embankment, roughly up a 300-foot embankment to what's called River Boulevard, or Rock Road, or River Road, the first macadamized, or macadamized road in the county. And you went from that point to Independence. Independence wasn't much more than a tent town at that time. So you'd go on up to Independence, and depending upon the weather or the time of the year, you would be outfitted in Independence, waiting for the grass to turn green or waiting for enough people that maybe spoke your own language to start onto the Santa Fe, California, Oregon trails. It was almost a, 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 a um, Jericho, almost a Jericho, because every language in the world was spoken there. So if you could imagine getting off a ship, going to Independence where nothing is spoken, you might not understand the language and trying to get yourself outfitted. So maybe this is why we have German communities and Italian communities and different things all throughout the nation. I do need, probably why she's kicking me here, is I do need to read the disclaimer. First of all, thank you for the, the big muddies for having us here tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> I added that part. <laughs> In case you didn't hear her she added that part. The definition of history, and I'm going to read this. My mother took 25 years of her life to get Wayne City Landing dedicated. Don't really know why it took that long, but she actually received a national award for being the, uh, the person who with the stick to it of longest to get it dedicated. My mother gave a lot of talks throughout the nation, and there were certain times my mother read things. And I understand that because some things you don't you don't want to get wrong, like somebody's list of achievements. Definition of history: the study of past events, particularly in human affairs. Everything that Audrey and I say is based upon what we believe to be truthful information that we have compiled from books, old newspapers, recorded household tales, personal observations, other historians, graveyards and anywhere else that we have found that was seemingly, seemingly reliable information. Please bear in mind that sometimes others before us have recorded information that is not correct. And we may inadvertently share something that may not seem quite the way you learned it in school. If you have information to share with us, please stick around. We'll visit about it later on. What part of history is important? Depending upon how you look at it, the dates, the events, the creations, in the future, what part of today will be worth remembering? A stone that a child throws in a pond makes a ripple. And then that stone sinks. The stone is found years later when that child has grown up and he's the farmer and he takes out the, the pond. Nothing that we do ever goes without record of some sort. Is that stone important? Is the ripple that it made important? Maybe to someone, maybe not. Okay, so now that that disclaimer is over, I think I can even go a little bit further to explain why there's a disclaimer. Um, my local historical knowledge is very specific and very based on um, whether or not maybe someone hired me to look into the history of a building um, or just something grabbed me and I needed to know more uh, whether I was being paid or not. But um, I started my company around 2009 and about 2002, when I was really digging in um, to specific local history, I found this place called Wayne City Landing. And I found out that it actually really existed to this very day. So I grabbed my business partner, and uh, she and I hopped in the car, and we found a river. And I said, I think we go north. So we went north until there was nowhere north more to go. And the car stopped, and we finally found Wayne City Landing. Really exciting and yet a little bit sad because this was such a huge part of local history, and no one really realized that it was there. It's, it's just this gift of history of the Missouri River and of Western expansion that was kind of underappreciated for a while. So um, that's when I had to start digging in and learning more. It has AKAs, 
So if you are in research and you see something that says or refers to Independence Landing or Rickman's Landing or Upper Landing or Wayne City Landing, it's all the same place. Um, Rickman's Landing, that had to do with a man with the last name Rickman. Uh, be, depending on who was running the freight, who was running railroad, that would have a, a bearing on what name it was being called. But in the journals, when the people going west were writing in their journals about the experience, you have to keep all four of them in mind to kind of know which place you're talking about. So, and it back to Matt. Ah, Lewis and Clark. Sugar Creek actually has four trails. Santa Fe, California, Oregon, and Lewis and Clark. The only place in the nation, hence the only place in the world, that has our, all four trails. Lewis and Clark came through roughly 1804 the first time. Uh, we've got very intricate records of them where they came through uh, the different drawings and different descriptions of different trees which are still around. Uh, and they stayed on a little island. If any of you know where Amoco is, Amoco was founded about 1903, 1904. Right off of that Amoco was a little island. Uh, the Mallinson family, not obviously at that time, but in the 1850s, that Mallinson family owned that island. It's also called Rabbit Island. Lewis and Clark stayed there, took their notes, did everything that Lewis and Clark do, do uh, and on their way back a couple of years later, stopped by there again. Shortly after that, they went towards the Fort Osage area. Um, I'm sure all of you have a pretty good knowledge of Fort Osage. They're not really a long-lived fort, but um, that first place of settlement uh, to actually have a fort, um, start creating some treaties with the Native Americans, uh, specifically the Treaty of 1808. Uh, the Osage Indians, um, the Osage people, lived in the Fort Osage area and it worked well for the camp. Um, still there today, not really the greatest landing for stopping a steamboat and going to, well, where? Um, I, I personally live out in that area. And um, it would have been a long haul to a trail to be going along the California, Santa Fe, or Oregon trails from Fort Osage. However, having Fort Osage in place was a point to start for further westward expansion for exploration um, and militarization of, of the western region. So in a sense, Fort Osage still has um, quite, quite an impact on what happened just a few miles further down the river. Um, interesting note, uh, they would, the Osage family that lived in that area would often refer to as the Little Osage. And the reason they were referred to as the Little Osage is because there just weren't very many of them. So I always thought that was kind of an interesting thing. If any of you haven't been out to Fort Osage, it's a great place to visit. Um, great stopping point, and it's almost kind of like you can just feel the expansion of history as you go further west. With Fort Osage, you have the Little Blue and you have the Big Blue River. The Indians liked the Little Blue and the Big Blue, and they kind of camped in between them. They had a lot of their settlements, if you will, in between those. Once the treaties started and our government started purchasing, whatever you want to call the term, purchasing the grounds from the Indians, and as the Indians were encouraged to move, that's when independence started. Originally, independence, I believe, was only 240 acres, I believe, was the original independence. The, the original city site was a one-mile radius. Yeah, very, very small. Okay. Now, in 1825, there came a large flood. The mighty Missouri flooded again. Not much written on it, and bear in mind that a lot of the knowledge that we have, Audrey and I have had to sift through a whole lot of these journals, for lack of better terms, uh, any, other, any old writings, so we don't really know 
a lot about Lieutenant Anthony Wayne. We know what happened. The big flood came. All of a sudden, Fort Osage, due to cholera, due to other things, closed up. Need another place to go? Well, wait a minute. We're moving those Indians out, and the Indians want to go home. Our government enlisted Lieutenant Wayne to prevent that from happening. Lieutenant Wayne found another location, the highest point, it's considered the highest point in Jackson County, above the Missouri River, to prevent that from happening. It's such a high location, remember we talked about it being 300 feet, that when you look one direction you can see tomorrow, when you look the other direction you can see yesterday. And I don't know where, that later. <laughs> and I don't don't know which way is which. But you can see tremendously long distance. Okay. That's where we want you to go visit the Wayne City Landing. When you're up there, he was preventing the Indians from returning back home. You have fur traders that came from St. Louis area. As Audrey said, there wasn't really that great of a landing area around Fort Osage. It was mostly established to help these treaties and help these treaties continue. They made more treaties with the Indians in about 1825 as well. Let's prevent them from going back home. Lieutenant Wayne was commissioned. We don't really know for how many years that he was there. But we do know that eventually a little town consisting of uh, eight or ten buildings were, was made right on the river. All that is gone from floods, subsequent floods. Along, uh, this became a great place for the fur trappers to start stopping, start stopping. And as the fur traders stopped there, they realized the safety. They realized that this is a great place, accessible place for boats to stop. So they went back to St. Louis and established basically the trade route right on up to Wayne City Landing. It wasn't too many years later, and they had started having the steamships coming in. And I kind of yeah, intervene at this point because the first draw to the area to go to Independence was uh, the Santa Fe Trail. And that was kind of like finding out that um, a new highway, this was like the Route 66 of the 1800s. So there was this new way you could go someplace else and be almost guaranteed to sell your goods and come back with more money. It made the people that were settled in the Independence area pretty wealthy very quickly. Um, that Santa Fe trade was a reason to start bringing a bunch of cargo from St. Louis to Wayne City Landing, down to Independence, and go down and sell those goods and wares. Um, it's, it's, an, it's interesting, there's a few accounts of the people getting ready to go to Santa Fe. At the same time, you started to actually have Western um, trail goers that were moving out to Oregon or California, and they say when the Santa Fe wagons were loaded, everybody could just deal with it. Just sit back, wait, Santa Fe is being loaded, you're not going anywhere until they go first. Um, so that's, that was the first big draw, the reason why independence I mean, I don't, I don't have a map yet. We'll get to one. But you have, here's the river, and here's Independence. And you have to go up. You have to go this way to get there, and then you go on the trails. Wouldn't it just kind of been easier to start straight off from the, from the stopping point at the river? Water was a really, really big issue, not just the navigable kind, the kind that, as was mentioned earlier, we need really good water to make beer. So they had a lot of natural springs and independence, and that's why you could create mills, several mills, and um, fresh water was the only way to start to go along the trail. Should we talk about the reason for clean water, besides I, beer? I think that you should talk about that, Dr. Melanson. Cholera. Mine's. I'm going to do that again in case I didn't catch on the camera. Cholera. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Cholera is one of the biggest problems that they had. And when they started on the ships, we, like we say, it's a two and a half, three day journey. One of the, when they stopped the steamships at Wayne City Landing or any other port along the way, but generally we we're talking Wayne City Landing, when they stopped at Wayne City Landing, the first thing they would unload would be 
the dead bodies. Cholera, especially at that time, was uh, you, you could be a very healthy individual, get cholera in the morning, show the symptoms in the morning, and by noontime you're dead. Sometimes the people would hang around and take a little bit longer to die. Uh, it was specifically when they were in the wagon trains. If it was three, four days, sometimes obviously a miserable death. If they showed enough signs and the wagon master thought they were going to die quickly, they would stop where they were, let the person die, bury them right on the trail so the rest of the wagon would run over and basically pulverize the body. They thought that was ways to keep the, the wolves, etc., from coming and scavenging onto them. Why is, how did they catch cholera? You know, you went through, you went through waterways, went through ponds, went through little streams, and, and I, I was raised on a farm. No matter what we told, told our cattle, they pooped wherever they wanted to. So you put cattle in the pond, you put cattle in the watering hole, they're gonna poop. If that cow has um, any type of a dysentery, any type of gastrointestinal problem, it stays in that water. And the next people come along and they pick it up. And, and that's one of the reasons that, uh, that the Fort Osage kind of went away as well. Okay, the Mormons and independence. This is an interesting story, I'll put it that way. Um, quite a um, strange situation. Um, the Mormon followers came into independence believing it was Zion and wanted to settle there. Um, it was part of their um, doctrine, their um, future beliefs of where to have a full settlement and be established. You know, depending on whose rendition of Mormon history you read, you might get one idea or another idea. But um, I always say that it, I'm blessed in one way that I didn't grow up in Missouri. I've been here for 15 years. And um, so I can kind of look at history just on a factual basis. I have no um, deep family connections to any of the stories. I just kind of look at it fact by fact. What happened at this point is there, were, there was a huge settlement of Mormon followers in independence. And you had the beginnings of the Civil War already starting to happen in 1833. The Mormon faith was not real big on the idea of slavery. Well, there were a lot of faiths that weren't big on the idea of it, but many of them kind of kept to themselves. And the Mormons did not. Um, they had a printing press in town on the Square in Independence and actually printed a newsletter, newspaper, and express some of these opinions. That was about the end of the first stay of Mormons and independence. Um, they were raided by um, an anti-Mormon group, came through, actually grabbed the printing press out of the building, threw it out, hard and feathered people, drug them, I think there were two hard and feathered, and ran them out of independence. They went back to Wayne City Landing. This was not the direction most people were going when they went to Wayne City Landing. They were coming from Wayne City Landing, not going to it um, from Independence. So they went back to Wayne City Landing. And what was the name of that? Interesting thing. I don't know if you can tell. This is the best picture I could find. There are some white blotches up in that back corner. You kind of see a silhouette of maybe some clouds beyond the buildings. You kind of see the white blotches. That was a meteor shower that happened that night. And so the Mormons believed it was God telling them that it was going to be okay and they were going the right direction for a reason. The people that sent them there believed it was God telling them that they did a good job by sending them there. So everybody had their own interpretation of the uh, meteor shower that night. But the Mormons actually camped um, at the river for a few days, went into Clay County where they were accepted for quite a while. Um, the river and that landing is a huge, huge part of Mormon history and their expansion eventually um, from Nauvoo all the way to Utah. Uh, and then, of course, um, independence was reestablished later on with Joseph Smith uh, III as the uh, restoration uh, 
to the reorganized church. Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was established there. So here's the really interesting end point for the Mormons and the day they were ran out of independence in 1833 is that a few years back, they, um, the county decided to redo the landscaping around the courthouse on the square. And while they were redoing that landscaping, there were a few people out there with a metal detector. And one of them found a little square of metal. And it was from a printing press. Ah, maybe. They checked it, went and found the papers that were being written that caused them to be expelled from the town. And it was from that printing press from the day it was tossed out that window. So. Gilpintown. Do I get to talk about yes, Gilpintown? Yes, you, you have to talk about Gilpintown. You live there. Hmm. Oh, I guess so. That's fine. <laughs> William Gilpin. Um, in my opinion, is probably should be one of the most well-known people in history. He was uh, the first geopolitician, meaning that he traveled from coast to coast. William Gilpin uh, started as a Quaker on the East Coast. I believe there were nine children involved. He was uh, educated in, in England, and he was also educated military-wise. He came to St. Louis. Uh, he was a self-proclaimed lawyer. If any of you know anything about lawyers at that time, you simply had to have a book and a shingle and say, I'm a lawyer. There wasn't really any true lawyer school. So William Gilpin, he was a lawyer. Came from St. Louis on one of the paddle ships, got off at Wayne City Landing, traveled up the hill. He saw independence as thriving. This, this is a place that I can make some money. Hmm. He went back to St. Louis, got rid of everything he had there, came on back, hung out a shingle. So he was an attorney for a long time. Then he starts looking at the area between Independence and Wayne City Landing. Three and a half miles of nothing but a ridge. He got people together first geopolitician. Politician, you use other people's money. He, um, okay, I'm a politician too, but not that type. Okay, so he got everybody else in town to put money into the pot. Anybody's name on a street sign in Independence, the old houses, etc., they were basically the ones that were on the list that joined in with him. They bought all the ground, basically between uh, where our house and winery is, all the way down to the river. Catch the people when they get off the river before they get up to Independence. A smart thing. They made what was called Gilpin Town. Not an actual town, but it was plotted out. They had livery stables, had everything that you would need. And then a flood came. 1851 flood. All of a sudden, the steamboats couldn't stop at Wayne City Landing any anymore. They could, but it was not very easy. So they went on to a port that was west of there called? Westport. Oh, that's about where we are. Yeah, okay. Went to Westport from there. All of a sudden, William Gilpin's going, uh-oh, got a whole bunch of people that just invested in a whole bunch of property, and now nobody's coming through it. So Gilpin built a school on where our winery is, which is about halfway between Wayne City Landing and Independence. Did I mention that's where my winery is? Okay. So he built a school and donated it to the county. He was hoping to bring people back out that direction from Independence and the county. Good thought, but it wasn't enough people. And some type of a civil war came along. William Gilpin left, went to Colorado, became governor of Colorado, eventually, or governor of Colorado Territory, eventually governor of Colorado. He was the bodyguard for three different presidents, including Lincoln. Didn't do so good on that one. Um, it was he, a job. <laughs> he, he was responsible for the purchase of a lot of the property for the railroad, national, uh, the first national railroad. He also was responsible for purchasing the Mexican Territory as of which a million acres wound up in his name somewhere or another. I don't, must have been a slip of somebody's hand somewhere or another. 
um, he had his hand in the government 50 years. Very intelligent individual, and he started right in what's now Sugar Creek. Uh, I need to tell you, too, when they called that the Independence Landing, it was only because it was in proximity to the city of Independence. Independence was not actually out that far. Independence was basically where the boundary lines are now to it. That's as far out as it had, had come to about roughly 24 Highway. Uh, William Gilpin's theory on where Independence is is that it's in the same uh, horizontal uh, longitude. Latitude, parallel. Thank you. Uh, around the world. The same location that all the old, old 2,000, 4,000 year old cities are. He says independence, that area will always be live because of the weather patterns, etc. When he went to Colorado, wasn't it in the same parallel? Same parallel, 40th. Hmm. He believed in it, and you know what? He's, he's kind of right because independence is still there. Yeah, he's, he's stuck to the line. Oh, okay, kind of a fun one. This is the Independence of Missouri Railroad. So I know we've got some history buffs with the river. Have any railroad buffs? This is the um, first incorporated railroad west of Mississippi. Uh, there's some argument that there were some other railroads that were put in place a little bit east of Independence. However, never, none of them were actually filed with the state of Missouri. But this one was 1849. Um, you can see my itty little map up there. Oh, okay, bigger copies. But basically, it went from Wayne City Landing all the way to Independence, um, kind of near where the post office is. And what it was, it was wooden. It was animal powered. We've read that it was horse pulled. We've read that it was mule pulled, cars. Um, no one actually knows for sure what animals. Uh, we have, it, it's online to see the entire filing of the corporation. It's, it talks about what the track was made out of. It says the animals would pull the cars. It explains the cars. It explains everything except for which animal it was. So maybe it was both. I don't know. Um, but the animals would pull the cars up to independence, and then by gravity, I'm sure to some degree, they could be the cars could be reloaded and they would go back down to the river. Uh, there was a charge for having your cargo brought up. Great way to make money. Um, everybody was in the frame of mind to make money. Um, this is about the same time as the independence uh, as people going to independence to go to California for the gold rush. This is May 3rd, 1849, and this is um, a typed version of a true journal. So this morning our boat started for Upper Landing. See, that's why you gotta know all the names of you. Where's Upper Landing? Uh, which is 12 miles from the lower. We arrived about nine o'clock after a pleasant run of three hours. This landing has a hard appearance, being at the bottom of a very high bluff and close to the shore. It's known by the pompous name of Wayne City, a most uninviting and dismal looking hole. <laughs> so, thanks guys. We landed the trunks and hired a man to take them to the city for 25 cents apiece while we walked, the distance being three miles. On arriving at the top of the hill, we had a grand view of the river below us. The road from the river to Independence runs through rolling woodland which resembles our own forest at home. And by the way, when he talks about that grand view, that's what you see when you go up to Wayne City Landing today. You're actually up at the bluff looking at that grand view over the river, like you said, to tomorrow or yesterday, whichever one that you want to see. <laughs> the hoax, the hickory, other forest trees seemed like familiar friends. The sweet notes of the familiar birds, robin, redbreast, morning dove, and yellowbird, brought to my mind pleasing ref reflections of home. The walk was a delightful one, and we relished it the more as we were just freed from the confinement of the boat. We arrived at Independence and took board at Mr. H. F. Herford Esquire House at $4 per week. 
The Noland and Independence houses are full as eggs, as is also every other house in town where boarding and accommodations may be had, and almost every hour in the day, landlords are compelled to refuse applicants for admission. Um, he goes on to talk about the busyness of town, and it ends with about a dysentery. So, you know, it's a little bit positive. It has a little bit of a sour note at the end, but um, just a really great example of exactly what was happening at that very period. And you'll, when you read the stories of the travelers coming west, they always make sure to describe the natural scene, especially when it reminds them from wherever it is they came from, because they're scared. They, they know they're going the right direction, but everything is so unfamiliar. As soon as they see something that just has an inkling of remembrance of home, we usually get some good detail. As people stayed around in the Independence area, they did a lot of journaling because they often were there for two, three weeks at a time waiting for to be outfitted, waiting for their wagons, etc. And it's that time frame that we are so fortunate to have a lot of the journal entries, which is which is how we're able to do some of this research. And we when we find something, as Audrey says, that says such and such landing, we're still scratching our head going, is that the right place? And if it is, and we continue to piece things together with houses, with tents, with people. Uh, so it, it's, it's truly a jigsaw. It's this 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. And if you're like me, it's the best jigsaw ever. Um, the ending, again, we had another flood. At this point, we had a sand bank that was very, very difficult to get a steamship up to. Um, and so Westport, with, as we were speaking about earlier, with its rock ledge, pretty much took over um, where the ships would stop coming from St. Louis. Really didn't matter in the long run. We're at 1851 at this point. You only have a couple more years before uh, everyone's coming by train. So uh, if it wasn't a flood that stopped the travel, stopping there, it was going to be a train eventually. And that's just been the evolution of travel in this world. I'm going to go to the 1851 flood. The train went out of business because it went bankrupt. If you don't have those ships stopping. The wooden train. The wooden train. If you don't have those ships stopping, you've got nobody to pay you a little bit of money. Now, remember this 300-foot bank that we talked about. That train didn't run on that 300-foot bank. That train started right down on the, on the ground level by the river. Uh, several of you are from the Sugar Creek area, and, and several of you I know grew up out there. If you remember where Amoco is, it went along, kind of where the Rabbit Island was eventually, went along at about a four to five degree incline. Up through what's now Elizabeth Road, through Sugar Creek Boulevard area, just a gradual incline, eventually to the Independent Square, which had a, a area that it turned around in. They would put the animals back on to, presumably, and again, as Audrey said, a lot of this is surmise, they put the animals back onto the wagon or the, in, into the uh, boxcar, if you will, uh, and use the brakes and basically coasted back uh, down to the Wayne City Landing. It went for, Audrey has found the actual uh, uh, application that they made to the state, so we, we know, I don't remember what was, what, what was it called, the Independence? The Independence of Missouri Railroad Company. Okay, uh, and, and it is truly given the distinction of being the first train west of the Mississippi. As she indicates, there's some others that have, that kind of claim to be, one down in Texas that we really can't find any information on. So at least at this point in time, we are still claiming it to be at least the first train west of the Mississippi and Missouri. The tracks were wooden, wrapped in iron of some sort. Again, that time frame, we can't find a whole lot, whole lot on it. Uh, 1851 flood, doggone it. Do you want to talk about what? Well, actually, we already did talk about that. You know, the, ah, that's what you see. That's the beautiful view. And it is muddy back that time as well. And just in case you're wondering, so that corner, that one is tomorrow. 
and and that one was the yesterday corner. <laughs> <laughs> the Missouri River was like an I-70, a 10-lane I-70 supercharged on steroids. The Indians used it, obviously. Uh, what's the quickest way to get around in that day? Good grief, you couldn't get through those woods if you wanted to. Obviously, the rivers continued to flow. Uh, it was huge. It wasn't very deep. The steamboats that wrecked on it, very seldom was there anybody that actually died because the Missouri River... I don't know, eight, nine feet deep most places. It's not huge. It was very wide, supercharged. The, the Indians, all their colonies, all their, I'm sorry, what do you call them? Tribes, families. Tri families and tribes relied upon the rivers, not only for fishing, but for traveling and trading as well. The Missouri River we should respect tremendously. And I applaud the efforts that the group here has to continue to try to make it to where it actually could be not only navigable, but to where it could be drinkable. This is how we've made attempts to make sure that Wayne City Landing is once again on the radar for American history, is by creating ways for people to remember what happened there, um, to find out what happened there. And last year, uh, Sugar Creek held its first Wayne City Landing Days Festival, and I was lucky enough to work with this awesome bunch of children, students, uh, from William Christman High School that are in the drama department. They memorized journal entries, and uh, we had candlelight tours. So anyone that wanted to could come up, walk along the sidewalks. It's really a beautiful spot up there. There's... Um, natural wild flowers planted on purpose, of course. Um, so it's a beautiful walk. So as you walked along, you would come to each one of the students and they would share a story as living history, a story about what their day was like or their experience has been like, very often through letters to a family member or a journal entry. Uh, by the time you got to the bluff, you had a pretty good idea what life was like. Uh, for the people that were coming to independence from that landing. So looking for more and more educational opportunities, um, more ways to bring attention to this really, truly forgotten huge piece of history. Okay, thank you so very much for having us. Um, we'll be here for a while. So.